believe that in the edit. <laughs> no, oh, come on. <laughs>Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from four exciting countries across Europe. Today, hello. Alessio. Ciao gente dall'Italia. Audrey. Bonjour depuis la France. And bucking the trend, not having an A name, it's your host, me, Fen. Or I could be A Fen today, I guess. A Fen. Yeah. We'll be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby and we'll start with seeing how it's happening during yeah. the period. Yeah. My boyfriend got me an early Valentine's Day gift and it's Ian's hand and as I am a newbie in deck building and that's, I think that's going to be a great thing to dive in in a co-op way because I, I like co-op games. I do love a good um, deck building game. I enjoy the co-op. We have a great time with it. Yeah, uh, we will probably play the, this weekend and see how we like it. On Valentine's Day, I think. <laughs> yeah. Alexis, what about you? Um, nothing too special recently. I mean, uh, I've been working on some uh, things that can really be uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, however, um, and that's a little preview for later in this episode, uh, I played a really fun game of uh, Dice Forge yesterday with uh, one of our Patreon, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, Audrey. So we'll discuss about that. Oh, speaking of Patreons, actually we have one new Patreon, so hi Matt. Oh, <laughs> <Thank> hi Matt. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Uh, it's, it's worth saying Matt's just not any old Matt, this is Matt. This is Matt from Geektopia Games, who uh, yeah, nice. will be collaborating with um, uh, once uh, he gets his... Uh, once uh, he gets his current Kickstarter sorted out, and hopefully, if he's willing at some point, and I know he listens, Obviously, uh, he might come on and talk with us. So you know, yeah, of maybe... course, you you are cordially invited. Let's put him on the spot right now. Uh, as we say in French, <laughs> as we say in French, it's an appel. No. Uh, as we say in French, as we say in French, it's an appel du pied, like calling for. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Yeah. What else? Well, I, I should just say, uh, Geektopia Games produced the rather excellent um, cooperative survival type game fearsome wilderness based on a bunch of American game fearsome wilderness based on a bunch of american folklore uh, i really enjoyed the dice mechanics in it um a lot and i do love games with good dice mechanics so uh, you know I, I imagine i'm going to be interested with what you talk about later today yeah co could be actually it was a very interesting kickstarter it was a very interesting kickstarter actually i think it could uh, do a bit better but uh, probably the time placement was uh, a bit unfortunate on that side yeah it was um it did come out at a time with a lot of really big kickstarters as well coming out um but i, I must say i i starters as well coming out um but i, I must say I, I really praise the multiple different ways of delivery. You know, yeah. literally people were backing to pick how they wanted to get their game, whether yeah. they wanted to do it themselves or get part of it professionally constructed and just print bits and they could have stand really consumer friendly. Yeah, actually, I hope that a lot of producers adopted that formula because it was a winning one. It was uh, the the STLs for the 3D printing. I think they are a winning decision because people is printing uh, models anyway. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I love some of the models as well. They're uh, just one of my favorites. Like just one of my favorite miniatures. Full stop. Really dynamic and like graceful looking. It's a yeah, wonderful that's model. Ca kind of inventive. Uh, it's a nice miniature. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, you know, I realised a lot of the time we skip past me talking. I usually try and dodge it, but um, no, uh, I've I've had um, a fair amount of um, games come in. Actually, a lot of stuff I've been waiting for. I am utterly backlogged up on stuff now. Just sitting on my shelf behind me, uh, I've got um, Zia Legends of a Drift System from 2014. I finally managed to get get that because I do love a bit of um, travelling through space. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned it last time, but I also got High Frontier. Um, I picked up Everdell with uh, all the currently released expansions because it has solo play and it scales up well with more. 
The board I... looks so nice with the tree <sighs> and everything. And everything. Everything about that game is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, I am nearly ready to play Sword and Sorcery. I've managed to secure the um, first, third, and fourth expansions for the first campaign. I'm just missing the second one. Um, and then I finally have to get my head around the rules for that because it's almost a, almost a role-playing game. Um, yeah, I got Under Falling Skies, which uh, I it's okay. It's it's all right. Um, I need to play it a bit more. Um, it's not grabbing me as much as I hoped it would in the reviews. Um, Great Western Trail I also picked up. Um, Great Western Trail I also picked up. Oh. Yeah, I, I can't. I haven't got the railway expansion yet, um, and there's a space in my box for it. So hopefully I do manage to find that eventually. Um, kettle, kettle, kettle. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And Fort. I also got Fort. <laughs> yeah. Um, from and Fort, I also got Fort. Yeah. Um, from Leader Games, uh, which is exactly like my favourite kind of game: card building engines. Uh, that you know, Glory to Rome, Race for Galaxy, San Juan, um, St. Petersburg. You name it, I've got it, and I love playing it. So this one, I'm I'm interested and excited with it. So this one, I'm I'm interested and excited with the. Uh, the higher player interaction and the defense of key cards for your particular deck combos is, is quite a nice interesting spin on things. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we're going to start off to talk about today. Uh, we're going to start off um, with... Uh, with news. Yeah, with news, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, in fact, in fact, it segues straight into it. Uh, Leader Games, um, uh, Root, the uh, Root Marauders expansion is has been announced and it's going to be kickstarting soon. On twenty third of February, I think. Yeah, uh, so around the time, well, just after this episode comes out. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So there's a Kickstarter. There's possibly the uh, actually most likely, most probably, stuff, uh, or go all in uh, in route like it happened with uh, Underworld expansion. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting point because uh, uh, this is a, a new expansion with a twist. It adds minor factions, and I'm not exactly sure how they exactly work, but it's... Right, help in games where um, there are lower reach factions or two players, uh, and there's a bunch of different ones. There's a, like, a special set of mechanics of working out when they come into play and everything, they're still hashing out. But essentially, they'll be on the board, um, and they'll do their thing, or they'll get in the way and stuff, and they kind of populate things a bit more and make it tighter. Populate things a bit more and make it tighter. The big part of this expansion is to try and ensure um, that the game works better with two players. So both of the factions come in at quite high reach, as in they can go, go quite far and have large numbers. So They're the Marauder, um, a Rat Horde, like Clenny the Scourge from Redwall, um, and Rat Horde, like Clenny the Scourge from Redwall, um, and the Badgers, who are like a Badgers bunch of... Badgers and the Bear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Badgers, are, who are like a bunch of... Um, uh, kind of a traveling faction, uh, quite tough, um, lower numbers than the than a rat horde, but still than the than a rat horde, but still fairly high presence. They're kind of what one of the what they call police factions. So a lot of what they're supposed to do is slap other players a bit. Why did you have to say that this makes the game even better for two players? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's. That's what they've been wanting to play. <laughs> uh, that's that's what they've been wanting to do for a while now, and um, and try and give ways for people to play with a bit with lower reach factions. You know, like if if you really love playing the Corvids, like I do, um, you can't really play them in a two-player game. Do, mm. Does this uh, expansion uh, only works in two-player game? Do, mm. Does this uh, expansion uh, only works in two-player games, or is it for uh... no? Okay. That's good. No, no, they, 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 all of their stuff, the, you can take the factions into any of the games, they work on balancing everything like that, um, and try and work on various interactions and, and things, and then eventually they get around to trying to make everything work with the Vagabond. Um, a very slight tangent, uh, but uh, you mentioned Red Roll, and they actually just announced that there's going to be a, a Netflix adaptation made by the person who made uh, Over the Garden Wall. 
Well, they've got some big shoes to fill because the previous adaptation was very good. Yeah, but uh, the... either they nail it, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> like the Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, which was amazing, and then yeah. they cancelled it, or it's like, what is this? Why? Why would anyone want to watch Altered Carbon? Why is it still going? <laughs> no, no offense to any Altered Carbon fans out there. I mean, when does the Expanse? You have to wonder why. Uh... Uh, it's just. I think there are better shows and they get cancelled and that's the frustrating part. That's true. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there was uh, two new um, uh, mini faction then? There's there's a number of mini factions. I haven't seen okay. the full list yet, but the uh, uh, they seem to be uh, 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 to um, uh, provide things. I, I haven't looked into it fully. There's been a few things put on Board Game Geek that I haven't had a chance to dig into. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the cats, like for example, could be one of the minor factions if they're not yeah, used. Yeah, I think the the cats would be the, the same exact faction as the. I really well, hope the otters are going to be one because I think that would be fantastic to have a little like minor faction that you can go trade with a bit. Yeah, also because the minor faction gets new meeples, and that always cool because the meeples are so cute and. Uh, also, uh, I think that uh, there are plans, or they have been talked about, or it happened uh, in a BGG thread, but I think that all uh, factions will get a, mi- a minor faction eventually in the form of a kind of mini expansion, like kind of a booster pack. Yeah, it would make sense. I mean, they've they've clockwork. Yeah, it would make sense. I mean, they've, they've clockworked uh, the... Uh, four starting factions and the chap who did the design is working on um, at least unofficial versions for the next fall so I would assume they do the same it makes sense to uh, broaden it all out and bring everything further to life by having the mine uh, broaden it all out and bring everything further to life by having the mine every faction available as a minor faction if they work and- yeah, and of course, as usual with the leather games, I think that there will be an early print and play when the Kickstarter launches, so we will know soon enough. Yeah, they're taking the tabletop simulator files and making their own print and plays. Yeah, if you know how to do that. So we will just see. Yeah, we will. Well, uh, it's time to get on to our actual um, main topics. So we're going to... Uh, go from talking about a bunch of furry critters trying to rule the United Kingdom with The King is Dead. Yeah, actually, The King is Dead. So uh, I will cover it if uh, if I'm allowed, so that this key, this can be my second entry into my King's trilogy. No, you're not allowed. <laughs> okay. We have uh, the monarchist of our, st- uh, of our podcast. Of yeah. course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was uh, gonna say you're only allowed if King Domino is the third one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we need to find the third entry. So uh, the King is Dead. The the King is Dead is actually a kind of war game which is not unlikely to pack Spamir Second Edition to make another comparison. Uh, Spamir Second Edition to make another comparison uh, to a kind of game like that. It's also rather like the ki- uh, King of Siam. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's from the same designer. Yeah. It's in a it's an implementation because yes. the King is Dead is uh, a second edition from last year from Pierce Sylvester. Second edition from last year from Pierce Sylvester, which is the designer from the original edition of King is Dead, which is a 2015 game, which is a reimplementation, let's say, of Koenig von Siam. I I highly miss David here, but I I hope I pronounced it decently. Uh, I hope I pronounced it decently. Uh, which is another game, which is kind of like this. Uh, King's Dead is actually a fine uh, is an exercise in essentiality, and now I'll talk about it. Essentiality, uh, and now I'll talk about it. Uh, the setting is that uh, King Arthur has just died, and uh, the England is in turmoil because there's uh, no one who is uh, the who is <coughs> going to be the new ruler. Excuse me, hang on. Yeah. Britain is in turmoil. Very Britain important. Is, the Scot- yeah, important. Is, the Scottish yeah. and the Welsh feature in this <laughs> very strongly as factions, and as somebody from the minor Celtic portion of Britain, and has spent the lifetime under the oppression of the English. 
<laughs> you should just say I suck at geography and deal with it. <laughs> so uh, basically, the Britain is in turmoil. The faction of the Welsh, the Scots, and the English are uh, squabbling over it, while France is a looming invader in the not not so in the distance. Uh, how the game plays? It's actually pretty cool and fast, which is an added bonus for this kind of a board, which is divided in eight regions with a ninth distant region, which is the Fra which is France, but has not uh, has not relevance for the influence. It's just uh, there, and. Uh, you basically get a hand of eight cards for each player. It plays two each player. It plays two to four players. But when you play in four players, you are actually playing in two teams with an individual winner. So it's a slightly different uh, kind of game. Anyway, uh, you get eight cards which are the same for each player. And there is a bit of variance which are the same for each player. And there is a bit of variance, but we will talk about it later. You get a hand of eight uh, cards, which are the same for each player. And you are not actually uh, siding with a specific faction. You are not representing either the English or the Welsh or the Scots. You are representing either the English or the Welsh or the Scots. You are indirectly using the influence over these factions to win. And uh, how do you play this? Uh, you basically uh, have a succession of turns in which each player the succession of turns in which each player the decides either to play a card or to pass. You don't get new cards, so you can have a maximum of eight actions. Uh, there are cubes with differently colored, which represent the. Uh, which uh, represent the uh, the actual factions in play in each uh, region, and uh, the action you can take are actually the influencing the number of cubes. Uh, what is cool about this system is that you are moving or or swapping cubes around, but whenever you take an action, you have to take a cube from the from the board and add it to your own area or, or, or to your own play area. That that means that that faction is as a less than it comes to a power struggle, but in turn you have a bigger influence over that faction because you are representing with one cube of that color. Uh, basically all the games plays like that and you'll spend a lot of turns passing because if you are okay with uh, every player passes and uh, the turn comes back to you there's a power struggle in play so you get the first region and uh, there are eight regions which are uh, dealt at random a number uh, the first region with the lowest number you uh, have a power struggle you uh, have a power struggle there and the faction with the most cubes wins now, what could happen is that uh, if there's a faction with most cubes, uh, you just uh, put uh, an indicator of the of a faction winning and controlling that region, and that's done. A faction winning and controlling that region, and that's done. That uh, faction is done. There are six, seven more to go. Uh, if you don't have cubes of any color or no player. Uh, no, no, no actual faction Welsh, Scots or uh, English could, could claim uh, majority over the others. Uh, that means that uh, faction is contested and you put one token, which now I will be helped by language, but it's instability. you put an instability disk to represent the instability on that uh, instability disks. Uh, France invades and the games <laughs> yeah and the games the game gets cut short and there is a different victory con condition so basically uh, this is a lot of intrigue because uh, the the decision space in this uh, is enormous you are usually better suited to pass because if you pass you have more action reserve for when it counts but if you keep if you keep passing your action won't be relevant 
when there is a power struggle. So uh, it is a very delicate game of intrigue, and actually the contested regions with uh, the majority of cubes in your court uh, of the faction who ends up having more uh, discs of their color in play. But if France invades, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the victory condition faction will count the same. So the one player which has more completed set of three color of cubes of three colors in its court win. So uh, this is basically the game, and I assure you that it plays in 30-60 minutes. I never played it four players, so I can. Uh, the, the game plays very, very fast. It is a very, very deep game, and it's actually a blast to play. You, you will end up wanting to play more. You will end up wanting to try a new strategy. You, we, we, we will end up losing and wanting to play because you don't deserve to lose. What I to play because you don't deserve to lose. What I really like about this game, I've yet to play it, but I I got really interested when you mentioned it on the on the Discord. Uh, is that there's a very large bluffing element, and uh, I always enjoy games that uh, force you to sort of a bluffing element, and uh, I always enjoy games that uh, force you to sort of uh, suss out what the next player's action are going to be and try to decide if you can allow yourself to take a decision and spend one of your uh, card or if you should better wait a little bit more just so that you can have the wait a little bit more just so that you can have the the higher ground. Um, yeah, that that game looks really interesting on that uh, on that front. Yeah, there's an entire category of elegance which is what you do counts, but what you don't do counts even more. And this game nails it. Uh, we love playing because uh, there. Uh, it makes for very, very, very fun and nasty interactions, and you actually get to know the game deeper and deeper as long as you play. For instance, a thing that happens is that uh, my first two or three plays I lost uh, when I happened to, lo to lose, because uh, I was uh, having a plan, I had a plan, but uh, since the influence on the board is indirect, and this is the way it... Uh, is very similar to Pax Pamir because you don't identify with a faction, you are actually using the faction to your own ends. Faction, you are actually using the faction to your own ends. Uh, when you end up trying to influence, uh, reading board state, even in a game this simple, because this game is very simple, it's always hard because you have to account for the variance in the in the power shifting variance in the in the power shifting and uh, your taking an action will remove a cube from uh, the, the board so if many players will uh, uh, will do that be before it's your turn again the board state will be com before it's your turn again the board state will be completely different also there are uh, there are uh, uh, cards which will allow you not just to swap cubes, but they will allow you to move around the regions will we will be which will be contested. The regions will we will be which will be contested so that you are expecting that the next region will be, for example, Moray, but uh, someone uh, swaps it and. Uh, now you are completely unprepared, and this happens all the time, and it requires. Uh, uh, this happens all the time, and it requires uh, uh, training to be able to read and learn about this this board state. Mm. So, like like Fan uh, loves to say, it has a low skill floor but a high skill ceiling. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> I've um, I I mean, first of all, I've got to say it's. Interesting seeing how this game has reiterated from King of, uh, King of Siam to the first edition of The King is Dead to this one, how it's improved and become um, more well-regarded uh, up until the point now where in 2020 uh, it made some people's Game of the Year lists of the year. Um, and, and that's rather nice. But for me personally, I've got very hung up on the board um, because uh, Wales is 
they they picked like a dominant county for each of the areas, um, <laughs> rather than actually name them. So Wales is named um, uh, Gwynedd. Uh, that's actually like the north county of Wales, uh, and it's interesting that they've gone with that rather than um, Cymru or some of the uh, older versions of Cymru. Ah, like, th- yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's where you're wrong here. Mm. Uh, it's actually an ARG, and the point is to start a civil war at the uh, the table if you play with. Uh, the point is to start a civil war at the uh, the table if you play with. Uh, an Englishman, a Welsh person, and a, a Scottish person. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you, yeah, you're not going to get a civil war. You're going to get the English being stomped from two fronts, <laughs> because that's the, the, the you know that that's uh, two fronts. <laughs> because that's the, the, the you know that that's uh, historically it's always been going the other way. And uh, let's just say, with the political nature in the United Kingdom right now, both Wales and Scotland are not doing particularly well, based on um, being less political aspects. And uh, finding out just how much Europe supported Wales, which was very obvious, but... um, And uh, Ireland. Yeah, yeah, and Ireland, of course. We're not going to get into the politics. It was more I was interested (laughs) that they picked Gwynedd instead of, say, uh, Morgano or... um, uh, Powys or any of the others. and uh, I really should have a look at the Scottish ones at some point. The entomology of the game very is very interesting. As I somebody mean, who at the very I know, I know. least, uh, you know, Britain got mm. uh, got different uh, counties and all of that. France yeah. is just France. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. They they are just France. Um, and also, this is, this is an Arthurian Britain, so you know, it's not really it's not really particularly. Uh, historically accurate, so it doesn't really matter. I, I was just fascinated by that choice. Uh, of course, I think it's to do with um, Owen, Owen Gwynedd. I think Owen Gwynedd. Um, my my Welsh history is not not super. Um, my my Welsh history is not not super great, um, to be honest, uh, <laughs> these days. But um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating game, and it's a nice look at. Uh, at a, uh, at well, it's it's really mainland Britain here. Um, it's not a, uh, at well, it's it's really mainland Britain here. Um, it's not yeah. exactly the United Kingdom because um, Northern Ireland's not involved at all, and it's not the British Isles because Ireland's not on there. Yeah, it's just uh, the the biggest annoyance for me is it's constantly sold out. Yeah, that's uh, that's a real shame, especially a real shame, especially since the game is not really expensive. I think it's uh, forty-five euros, something like that. Um, yeah, which so. which is just on the right range for like a, a short, uh, fun strategy game um, like this. What I really uh, enjoyed from the look uh, that I had I had of it is that it's it managed to really. Um, both have the simplicity of a um, to both stay simple, but also uh, um, uh, be open for a wide range of tactics. Like it's not as hard as uh, uh, some of the the more uh, complicated uh, European um, political games. Um, uh, my mind goes to Crusader Kings, but like the equivalent in board game form. Um, intrigue you, intrigue you. Yeah, but it, it managed to stay simple, but it's not as simple as other games um, with the games, and I that that makes it really interesting in my eye. Yeah, it's simple but not random, and this is a great plus yeah. for this kind of game. I think it is categorized as a war game because of this. Uh, it is a war game with an indirect influence on the board, so it's again, it's exact. You may be completely de- deterministic in what happens and yet deciding to pass or your opponent deciding to pass or play an assemble in in a very specific moment will change the game forever so uh, this is a very very good piece with a, a pool of action relatively simple and small everyone get to play the same cards and there is a variant to this uh, I think we can talk uh, about it right now, but uh, basically uh, in this second edition there are uh, 12 cards, uh, which are can- are uh, 12 cards, uh, which are canning, like uh, uh, since we are talking about British, uh, I think uh, 
and uh, uh, I have to say, Fenn posted uh, an image of uh, Rowan Atkinson <laughs> yeah, jiggling so the crowd. Black <laughs> so, exactly. So, exactly. So, Black Adder style. So, exactly. So, exactly. So, Black Adder style. It's you have cunning plans at your disposition. Uh, and you can decide uh, uh, to play with this variant. In this case, uh, you remove the... I'd just like oh, to yeah. point out, the, the image is a Brown, Rowan Atkinson as Johnny English. Where the crowd yeah, that, that's for... Brown, Rowan Atkinson as Johnny English. Where the crowd yeah, that, that's for Johnny English yeah. uh, when he's crowned King of England, the, of United Kingdom, actually. <laughs> but uh, the cunning plan is from Sir. I have a cunning plan from Baldrick from La Cadre. Played by Tony Robinson, a national treasure. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Played by Tony Robinson, a national treasure. <laughs> yeah, <Definitely>. absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, you have 12 cunning cards, which you can swap with uh, three English, Welsh, and Scots support in a game. And these 12 cards are each, di are each, di are different each one from each other. So uh, what happens, it will add a bit of a symmetry to the game to play a completely different experience. Now, uh, I'm usually not a fan of the of uh, adding a lot of variants to uh, spend a lot of useful playtime deciding what you are going to include or exclude from your game. And that kind of customization is usually either cosmetic or completely unbalancing. Now, I have to say that uh, I feel that some of the actually unbalanced, a bit unbalanced, because the, for example, the espionage card is, uh, I find it a bit to be a bit more powerful than others, but I have to say that this is a nice variant and refreshes the game a lot, especially for the players of the first edition. So, uh, that, uh, that, and I have to say that Benoit Billion, I I actually uh, need Audrey's help uh, to to pronounce the name correctly. But the artist of the game uh, really uh, really made a beautiful beautiful game, which a nice he made a beautiful beautiful game, which a nice uh, which had as, as a nice heart. And is a, a lot better than the first game, which was illustrated by him, and all the same. Mm. So that's it. King yeah. is dead. It's a very good game. Uh, the king is dead, um, and hopefully, um, and hopefully, uh, one lands on the shelves again and stays in stock. Uh, but of course, <laughs> you know, one can't have armies without blacksmiths and their forges. So uh, next up, we have an entirely different kind of smithing in Dice Forge. Uh, Alexis, would you like to take it away? Um, yeah, say as a mythical hero, uh, trying to get the favor of the gods by fighting monster. Uh, functionally, though, the game doesn't really engage with the team much, uh, as it's only a background to the actual mechanic of the game. Uh, as the name uh, implies it, it is a dice building game, which is a sort of, um, sort of um, clever switch onto the... Uh, engine building uh, building game uh, it's dice building because instead of making out a deck of cards where you take out the, the cards and refine your uh, your next row you have uh, two six sided dice that with removable with removable uh, tiles and during the game you'll be spending resources to get new faces that you get that will get you more resources so you'll sp uh, you'll swap uh, tiles that gives you one gold for one that gives you four so the next time that you roll that one instead of getting a puny world one gold you'll get a four uh, mm -hmm. um, and the thing is that uh, those tiles will have uh, different and fun combos sometimes you have a, a tile that gives you a times three so if you roll that one by itself it doesn't do anything but if you roll it with a one gold then it becomes a three gold um, it can get really um, useful and in um, useful and interesting. Uh, what's really neat about the game is that everything is uh, streamlined and uh, players are constantly making decisions. During uh, a turn you'll either be um, buying uh, an action card or a new dice face, a new dice face, and the card uh, will give you one-time bonuses or sometimes permanent one. 
Um, and uh, thanks to to that, you only have two actions to to do. So during your turn, you you're going to make that decision very quick. And at the start of your turn, and at the start of your turn, every player is going to roll their die, uh, meaning that uh, even when it's not your turn, you're going to roll, gain resources, and uh, already plan your next turn because you'll um, know the, the range of action that you'll have. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the game uh, is the game uh, is the uh, inlay uh, is the, the inlay and the physical component. Uh, the dice with face that you can exchange are all very sturdy. The hero boards uh, have indents so that you can count your victory points and your resources. And the box itself, uh, when you you put everything back, uh, you can back. Uh, you can then just uh, take it out in in five minutes and have it ready to play. Um, it's it's all really neat on the, in that sense, uh, and because of the game goes so fast and as so, um, and the, the actions are so streamlined, uh, you uh, you can really play it out in less than an hour um, with two to three player, maybe a little bit longer with four. But it's it's really the kind of game that you can just play with your family super quickly or with friends because it has. Uh, well, a little bit like the king is dead, um, a, um, a low, um, a low on three points, but a high uh, ceiling. Uh, I've played it with a friend of mine, Remy, and um, he, he really insisted so that, that I call him friend. I'm not sure why. I, I barely know the guy. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a little joke for him and I. It's a little joke for him and I. Uh, and uh, Audrey. Um, and I think yeah. that uh, Audrey had a lot of fun with it too. So. Yeah, yeah, it it was it was really fun because uh, you really have to think about what you will improve at some point. Because oh, which uh, which resource do I want? Uh, dice sides do I want to buy? And also, I I like games where which are not cooperative, but I don't like where there is strong interactions that can block you. And that's definitely the case because the strongest interactions that you can have is what be given a tile for a, a side for your dagger that gave it to you gets a bonus. Yeah, that's not a big deal in blocking you uh, and uh, fighting for the spaces where you can buy the special moon and sun upgrades and here when you just take a spot where there was another player you just give that other player the opportunity to make an extra role so anywhere and that's something I, that I really enjoyed I think it's a game that can work well also to introduce people to game because they won't feel like oh I wanted to do that but now I can't and what's the point yeah, uh, actually, uh, a thing I noticed about uh, about the game is that uh, uh, we usually take care into having uh, the the deck at the exact right sides to reap the benefits. Uh, the old generation deck builders uh, had you uh, basically build the biggest deck as possible because uh, you will uh, get all the bonuses and didn't care a lot for optimization now in your deck and uh, it's an interesting take to bring it to 60 sided die because uh, you have always six faces you are always something to sacrifice and, or to change i think that sun and moon tokens are really really important in this game and uh, to play the entire game with a different distribution because basically the D6 is exactly one in six uh, probability with uh, no shuffling, no 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 drawing, no, no no anything else except rolling dice. So that's a very, very interesting game. One thing that I really liked about the, the game too is that the action that you take um... Even though it's a, a game that where you are in opposition with a, a other player, the action that you take are going to have an impact on uh, every other player. So, for example, the dice faces. There's a limited number of dice faces. There's a limited number of them, um, uh, and there are a few that are unique. So, if you manage to buy them first, uh, you can like snatch them from um, um, be behind the nose of um, uh, in front of the nose of uh, someone else. Um, which means that your stats, 
your actions will always have uh, a slight consequence. And when you buy uh, a card on the board, you also um, take up a uh, board space. And if the, another player wants to get that same card, or um, you you are actually usually um, uh, protect two cards at the same time. If another if another player wants to take that uh, that space, they'll have to push you away from the space where you are. And uh, when they do that, you get to roll your die an extra time. So they have to um, sort of uh, wait out if it's a better idea to to do it on another turn, or if it's okay, or if it's okay to uh, get you some bonuses uh, by by pushing you away. Uh, it, it makes every small decision interesting. Um, and yeah, it's it's really fun. And I think that the balance is also really good since uh, when we played um, um, Remy, Audrey and I, uh, I think that uh, I don't... I won because I forgot to roll one or two turns, so I won. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you are telling me that Audrey is still winning? O o Audrey and I finished at uh, 95 points. Um, that Remy was at 93 or something like that. Like everybody no, was I, like. Two I, points. I was at 94 and you both were at 95. Yeah, that's the one. But but uh, we finished with one point difference. That's um. Seri seriously, guys, we have to stop Audrey from, from <laughs> winning from winning this match. Yeah, the the proof that the game is is well um, balanced. Question. You, you play all the time. I mean, you are not watching the other players play because it goes so fast. You just have one action and then it's back to the other player. So it's your turn to roll because it's everyone's turn to roll. So you, you just always have something to do. Yeah, that's, it, not... that, that, that's something that I really like, especially since there's a lot of um, board games that don't really care about the, the, the time that players will spend around the board sometimes. And I know a fair few where turns can last for uh, five to ten minutes, and you just uh, end your turn. You know, per, per, took out their phone and played for a little bit because they they just have not been active for a while. Yeah, I I actually watched the video you posted, and uh, I actually can say that you can learn to play the game in ten minutes, which is a big big plus for a game. This. Uh, uh, actually long because for a game this uh, uh, actually long because it's one hour and uh, so pack it with action yeah um, that that's really cool so you can really explain the rules of the game in less than five minutes and then all the different cards in um, five minutes too it's five minutes and then all the different cards in um, five minutes too it's all uh, using only icons which uh, i really enjoy it means that even if you buy the game in um, in finnish or in swedish you can just pick it up uh, explain what the icon means and everybody around the table will be able to uh, explain what the icon means and everybody around the table will be able to play uh, that that's also why i like it because uh, i have um uh, two board games uh, places where I, where I play mostly and one of them is uh, only in French, the other is only in English so um, it uh, it uh, it makes it easy to, to just have the same game that I can use in two different places Yeah, pro tip if there's a game with low language dependence, uh, you actually buy it in Spanish because Spanish have every game <laughs> That's good to know um, I didn't have a chance to get into Dice Forge, really. The only thing I'd have to say, really, is that um, I'm impressed they've been so reserved with their expansions, which I do appreciate. That, that is true. There's only been um, one expansion? Yeah, a few promos, and yeah, Dice Forge Rebellion. Yeah, Yeah, uh, the, the promos are just um, different uh, pictures for the cards. You know, changing anything is just like if you go to their events, they'll give you like different... Which is cool! Oh, so they're, they're cosmetics. They're only cosmetics. Yeah. It's, it's Which, just cosmetics. It's, okay. it's just cosmetics. But that's much better. In my opinion, that's something that I prefer because you, you get something, but it doesn't change your game. Yeah. It doesn't break. And you don't feel like you're missing out if you don't have it. Yeah. Exactly. It's actually how I think promos and things like that, limited time stuff should be done, really. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the best way to do. Um, to, to go on a very small tangent... Um, the game, oh, what's the name of it? Uh, 
Siege Storm ha had something like that. Uh, it's it's like a magic type uh, card battler game. Uh, and the fun thing is that their promo cards are um, uh, they call it pay to win, and basically they're a little bit like uh, Exodia. If you manage to like fulfill a specific condition, you immediately win. They have like a golden foil, and they're like uh, Exodia. If you manage to like fulfill a specific condition, you immediately win. They have like a golden foil, and they're really just meant to be, um, you know, n not really playable but just fun. I think that's also a good way to have it to just have something that is, um, yeah goofy and doesn't feel like it would change it's also a good way to have it to just have something that is um, yeah goofy and doesn't feel like it would change the the type of play absolutely and, and correct me if i'm wrong but i believe scythe did something similar that they had a load of promos and then they collected yeah. them all together which i think is really good yeah. yeah. Um, th there's also that. Uh, um, th there's also that. Uh, what's the name of it? That that board game that uh, is going to put out a, a card pack with every. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, Sidestorm. Yeah, they, they have one expansion, um, which is actually uh, where you add a little um, board on top of the main one, where you can take different actions. It slows the game down a little bit, uh, which is slightly unfortunate, but it adds a lot of flavor to the game and it forces you to uh, divert your attention to multiple things. It's, mm. it's yep. I've, uh, only played one of the two, but uh, it works pretty well. I'm just looking at a picture of it in action. It looks like, it, uh, for a starter, they've managed to make the box something you don't want to toss away. Um, yeah, um, and it, it, because it sits and expands the playing area by the look of it. Exactly, they yeah. they always try to do that where the play area as um like a little uh, thing to put your token and things. It's mm -hmm. it's quite well done. I think that their inlay is really exceptional, and um, <laughs> in many board games, a good inlay is something invaluable. And it's the sort of thing that you don't uh, you're missing until you have it or until you have a really bad one. Like uh, in video games, uh, a good camera is something that you will not notice, but a bad one you'll notice immediately. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, when you mentioned cameras, I was just thinking of the Super Mario series. When they moved to 3D, initially you controlled the camera yourself. And for some people, that's like overwhelming. Galaxy, when they start playing with gravity and stuff, they program the camera in a yeah. really good way that you're always at the center of the action, no matter whether you're going up or down, left or right, and they carried that forward. Definitely. Um, it yeah yeah a good uh, good set of mechanics or things like that. It improves the game experience, and uh, you can get the same with inserts certainly. Yeah, Di there's like a lot of example uh, of of bad insert that mm. uh, block the play, and that's actually uh, our next topic. <laughs> yeah yeah you're right. So uh, Dice Forge's excellent ergonomic storage design brings us very neatly to our last topic for this episode. It's one that's often overlooked uh, both by players and very importantly by public. Um, now, this is uh, definitely a topic I'm very passionate about. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how many people know in the general public, but I'm an absolute insert snob. I'm not ashamed of it at all. A good insert not only improves storage by reducing it as much as possible, uh, but also improves break setup and breakdown uh, by giving you uh, very quick ways of pulling different pieces out, getting them to players fast, having uh, essentially tokens already in a tray that you just take out of the box and put it out for people to reach from to put back in. Uh, and also, more recently, being able to just hand being able to just hand everything needed for one player direct to them. And just be like, there you go, you're ready to go. Or you just need to do a couple more actions and you are that's everything you need for the game. Um, it is it's a passion of mine. I am absolutely somebody who will go after third party inserts. Uh, I've even been known to get a third party insert and be like, this one isn't good enough um, and toss it and then go for a, a one I feel is better suited to my needs after playing with it a bit. There's even been a few games. I have been unable to play without a good insert and um, we will talk about a few of those later but first of all how do you guys feel about inserts? <laughs> I actually was used to bad inserts because that was kind of the the norm uh, 
<laughs> back then when I, I think in the late 90s after Settlers of Catan there was plenty of bad bad inserts and uh, oh, like uh, I, I I was talking with Fan uh, before this recording and actually uh, I think that uh, uh, the the very minimum the, the the minimal level of an insert it is that it should be better than having no insert at all. I mean, if I have a box, I mean, if I have a box, I put everything in bags mm -hmm. and uh, put it into the box. That's the level zero. Yeah. If a, <laughs> if an insert does worse than that, and I have a personal and uh, I hate with a passion the kind of insert which are just a bit of cardboard, kind of insert which are just a bit of cardboard which makes just a, a straight slot in the middle of the box. I have to say that uh, Asmodee games or all the FFG games uh, are the, the, the most at fault uh, with this. This I, I hate that. It's just uh, this. This I, I hate that. It's just uh, still space and it gives you no advantage at all. That, that's my opinion. I agree to a certain extent. Um, before we ask Alexis and Audrey's opinions, but um, with for me. I think the worst uh, is actually the badly made. The worst uh, is actually the badly made plastic inlay because at least a cardboard inlay, if it's bad and you throw it out, it's not as environmentally terrible as an awful lump of plastic, and that does matter to me. Um, uh, we'll get onto it a little bit later, but one of my favourite inlay makers is uh, tries to be green. But one of my favourite inlay makers is uh, tries to be green as possible. Um, and I, I just hate it. My, I think the most famous that I can think of is what's known as the phalanx insert, and it's Rio Grande, and they just stuck this same insert in all sorts of different games, and it just doesn't fit anything at all. It's absolutely <laughs> terrible. Physically, it's well made. You know, it's not like terrible plastic. Like sometimes you have plastic so bad that it's broken by the time the box gets to you, even though the box isn't damaged. But um, yeah, it, that that uh, that particular period where it was just we'll just put this same vacuum formed inlay in there, and people look and go, okay, so I've got this piece that's like I I, I don't <laughs> I don't know. So um, Audrey, how do you feel about inserts? Do you care? I think that it's a very useful component. Uh, I am not a die-hard fan of insert, but in any game that uses many tokens, uh, many different pieces, several boards, etc. I think that it's a little buggy, but it feels better to just say, okay, I take my token tray, I put it on the table, I take out the lid, and I'm ready to play. For me, it's really the speeding up of the setup that's comfort. Yeah. On, on my end, I find myself a little bit between... Um, yeah. on, on my end, I find myself a little bit between um, Fen and Audrey, I think. Uh, a, uh, a good insert will make me happy, but if I have an okay insert, I, I won't mind too much. Um, I don't think it's it's that necessary, and there's a few games where I don't I won't mind too much. Um, I don't think it's it's that necessary, and there's a few games where I don't really care too much about the insert themselves. Um, but a bad insert uh, will ruin a game. And there's a few games that I can think of with terrible insert that made uh, playing it uh, take longer. I can think of with terrible insert that made uh, playing it uh, take longer. Um, we'll mention a couple of them later, I'm sure. Yeah. But one of them that I can definitely uh, talk about since I'm the only person in the world that played that game <laughs> uh, is... Um, uh, I, I'll probably mention it at some other point uh, in the podcast, but it's called uh, Ends of Doom, and it's it's kind of a, a role play slash campaign map adventuring uh, sort of game. And the thing is that it's made by a tiny um, indie company, and the problem is that the, there's no inserts. the The box just box just comes uh, with a few bags, and that's it. And the problem is that there's um, I think in total maybe uh, 12 decks of cards or something like that. Like everything um, comes in, in, in like different types of cards uh, that you shouldn't really mix uh, together. Um, like uh, just if you put everything in the box, even in little bags, 
uh, setting up the games takes about 20 minutes. And at one point, I got so annoyed with it. And since it's um, it's an indie game, it obviously doesn't have a you know a company that makes good insert for them. And if I wanted to make something custom, it would custom it would cost me a lot. So I just uh, grabbed some cardboard and made myself my own little um, uh, insert homemade. <laughs> And uh, since then, uh, instead of taking uh, 15 minutes to to play that uh, to to start that game, it takes me less than five, and I can just like put it on the table, take out the, the little uh, cardboard insert that I've made, and up the game is ready to play because every deck of cards is ready. Every deck of cards is like separated into the, its different like adventure and monster deck, and it's just really um, it, it's game changing when it's really bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I was just you just have to be thinking about uh, I, back in two thousand and eight, I picked up a second hand copy of the original Warhammer Quest, uh, the nineteen ninety five edition, and ha. I built mm. an inlay for that out of foam core um, and soft rubber and everything to protect all of the pieces that were not miniatures. Uh, it made, uh, but it's a nineteen ninety. I want to say nineteen ninety five game. I think. I I think it's nineteen ninety five. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The the golden age or the first golden ages. We're in a second golden age of Warhammer now. I think. Um, <laughs> it, it, that made a huge difference. But I, I'm looking around on my shelf and um, I've seen a number of different interesting sort of things. So, I I do want to talk about some of the third party inlays, but uh, uh like Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Game Trays did that, and honestly, right now they are like, if you, if you're gonna make it out of plastic, do it the way Game Trays does it. Get Game Trays does it. Get them to do it. Get them to quote whatever. But please, they just get everything fitting in, and they have it all set up in a wonderful way that you just pull it all out. Eclipse is the example of just being able to hand people stuff just literally here you go here's the tray uh, lifted just literally here you go here's the tray uh, lifted up the top part is your resource tracker the bottom half contains all of the models you'll need uh, you just need to pick which faction you're gonna be playing as and all of the other components are just the trays come out onto the table yeah it, I actually I believe that it does parks as a games tray insert and the upcoming unsettled from orange games which i backed and it's coming soonish um has one as well uh though they've showed the um mechanical like design of what it's looking like and it looks fantastic uh on mars is one that's got a really great inlay uh superb but um hmm. and uh oh, whatever there's uh, yes oh deep madness from dimension games really expensive um they, they did a monstrum and a profundum box i think and the profundum box holds all of their released um components like from so good that i own two of them and use the second one to hold all of my descent models because descent with fantasy flight is like are they ever going to do a good inlay a fancy flight ever gonna bother i don't i don't think so this <laughs> one they do an inlay that's good for shipping and then you look at it and go well if i turn it inside out Maybe I can use it for. Um, um, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Zia, uh, Legends of Drift system. That has like an almost good inlay. It's a bit frustrating because um, everything packs in nicely, but if you dare let the box go off vertical, everything goes everywhere, which is how like the old Settlers of Catan or um, uh, Betrayal at House on the Game uh, ready for uh, traveling on ships. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> you want a very steady car as well that doesn't really rattle anywhere. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I think that Android Netrunner, which is a car game with I think twelve tokens or mm. something like that, just money. It's a car game with I think twelve tokens or mm. something like that, just money. Just credits are the the biggest number of tokens. Otherwise, tax I think are are five or six. Android Netrunner, which is just a card game, a living card game, with uh, just a big box, it is uh, the worst, just a big box, it is uh, the worst insert ever. Well, it has the, the, the straight slot and it doesn't fit everything. Uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it's not a good insert. Thankfully, it's just a card game. Uh, mm. it, it's, a, it's a dead living card game. It's important to mention. Yeah. Uh, oh, all the options. Yeah. Uh, oh, 
Although, yeah, recently they've been uh, talking about reviving it, and from what I've seen, the people that are behind it are going to make uh, a really good job. Like they've been talking about uh, rebalancing the game to be faster and um, and more snap uh, snappy. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, it, it's it's not the the subject for the moment. Yeah, but um, I'm really excited here in, about it. Here in here in my shelves, uh, I have uh, Riot Games' first board game, Egg versus Minion, and I think it's a very great example of good inlays, because you have different trays, so you, I think you have three or four layers of trays that you can each take out of the tray space is for the Minion miniatures, because you have more than a hundred uh, miniatures of the Minions in the game, and they have four or five different skulls, but the slots for the miniatures were made with the thought that you could put any sculpt in it. So you have a minion with an axe, you can put it in a slot. You have one in with a shinion with an axe, you can put it in a slot. You have one in with a shield, you can put it in the slot. You don't have to care and think, oh, this mini, which is the slot for this specific mini? Oh. And I think that's a great thing. That is, that is. Especially when you have a hundred. Yeah, I was going to say, Rising Sun's original packaging is like that, where not only does it... I was going to say, Rising Sun's original packaging is like that, where not only does it model have to go in a specific slot for it but some of them um go in a mo go in a slot behind a mo another model so you have to like jigsaw yeah. fit them in and oh, that that brings us like almost onto um talking about like the third party inlays because rising sun's one of the third party inlays because rising sun's one of them that uh, I, I remember i remember the, the dragonfly oh. clan mm. from rising sun and just to finish, the only downside of the Meg vs. Minion original insert is that if you sleeve every game, you can't sleeve the extra cards that you unlock over scenarios. That's the only thing. You have okay. to find somewhere on the side. I have uh, a complaint here to issue about uh, plastic inserts which hold the PVC miniatures because this is a thing that uh, Awaken Realms does and actually it is in a game I like which is Dark Light Memento Mori. Uh, when I got uh, the game shipped to me, or the PVC of the miniatures, so something went broken. Uh, nothing that you can fix, of course, but uh, this kind of inlays which just fit the miniature are terrible for shipping moving and uh, moving around. Uh, with the Walker Realms, uh, Nemesis uh, was, uh, was the same. There are miniatures which get snapped by the just the torsion on the by the torque I think on the on the box mm -hmm. when it moves because PVC versus art plastic it's just something breaking. Interestingly, both of those games for me have it's just something breaking. Interestingly, both of those games for me have, have managed to avoid that, and I I still use the original inlay on both of them. Um, I, I still use them, but when you move them, uh, you have to be extra careful because if you if you had a bit of torsion of of, of movement, you had a bit of torsion of, of of movement through some weird axis, uh, the, the the plastic tends to tends to snap parts uh, like tusks or something or uh, tails of PVC miniatures. Okay, uh, I did want to just bring up the actual game that caused this topic for me, and that is um, the critical and or public darling of Gloomhaven. Um, oh. <laughs> and now, I'm not, no comment on the game itself, but the experience of setting up and breaking down, even with baggies, everything, once you've unpunched it all, it just does not fit in the box, no matter what you try and do. It, it's just, it, the lid kept on sitting up, and it would take half an hour, 45 minutes to get everything ready, and you'd sit there going, oh, I, I kind of don't really want to put this away while we're playing, because <laughs> uh, it, I'm going to set it up again. So, I, I got um, uh, last summer, uh, my parents bought me as a present. They bought me the laser ox inlay for it, and that changed everything. Once I built the inlay and I got all the pieces sorted out, which took a couple of hours, um, it it's like five minutes to set up. It's like five minutes to set up. So just pull the stuff out, hand it out, boom, 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 and you're good to go. And I was like, this this has changed everything. I, I'm frustrated that Gloomhaven. It's just been released the way it is. Like it's just, 
it, it has too many parts, just like fa- too many parts, just like fantasy flight games. There's too many things for it to, to be. Oh, here's all the things. Stick them in a box. Sort out. Organize. Organize it yourself. It's like true. True stories. Uh, and they cover both games because basically Gloomhaven and Descent First Edition uh, have the same issue. And Descent First Edition uh, have the same issue. Uh, Gloomhaven far worse. Uh, when I got my first Kickstarter copy of Gloomhaven, um, I arranged a, a game with my gaming group and uh, someone showed up half an hour late. Uh, someone showed up half an hour late so we began setting up first scenario uh, with half an hour uh, delay and uh, in two hours we didn't manage to complete a session mm-hmm. yeah it sounds familiar i got the e-raptor insert for the e-raptor insert for it so it doesn't fit the expansion whereas some inserts do if i remember correctly uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you just need to you just need to have one because else all the tokens, all the tiles, they, they just don't fit. And even all the little cards for the um, monsters, I write them, and there is nothing to separate in the basic insert. So yeah, it's it's just so much needed. I actually Gloomhaven is the only game that I cannot play without uh, the app for the AI and without the without an, an insert which. So- I I don't have Gloomhaven, but that reminded me a lot of of my experience when I first started playing Kingdom Death, where I would um, I had this extra room at my parents. Um, where I would set up the game uh, because the room was was pretty much unused. I would set up the game on a large table, and then invite friends to play over. And then at the end, I would have to spend 20, 30 minutes just putting everything back. And that was always such a <laughs> distressingly yeah, but... long time, especially since we always made sure to play like until the last moment in my friend w- went, because what I want when I have friends... Are... Puzzle game, then you can get some really good ones. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I could pick up uh, Detrominos or something mm. like that. There, there are fun ones. There are fun ones. Uh, I might talk about uh, them on the next episode. Mm. Ooh. Um, I w- yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's it's just uh, so annoying, especially when, uh, to have uh, good games with a good insert will manage to, to um, cut that in half. I have to leave sorry, uh, but it's a work day, so goodbye everyone. I leave you to this discussion. Mm. Don't, please don't throw chairs uh, from the windows. Please don't throw chairs uh, from the windows. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Have fun. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, see you. Yep, see you. Next time. Okay, uh, yeah, um, so I think I'd like to go on now and talk a bit about the third-party inlays, um, which uh, is a bit about the third-party inlays, um, which, uh, so generally they seem to come in two different types, like not many people do vacuum-formed ones. They, you're either getting uh, foam ones or you're getting um, laser-cut wood ones. So Felter are the guys who do most, uh, are the guys who do most uh, or i've had most experience with on the foam ones i'll be honest i think they're great if you have a lot of miniatures i really wish they'd do a laser cut section for the actual game components uh, because a foam tray holding like cards or tokens or even metal bits just doesn't work even metal bits just doesn't work it flops all over the place Um, but they do really good kingdom death um, miniature trays yeah really good yeah, I moved two countries with it, so yeah, mm. it's really good. Yeah, I uh, I shipped all mine across um uh, across the North Sea, uh, all mine across um uh, across the North Sea and the English Channel, and um, flew uh, over to from the UK to Sweden with my um Dragon King, and the only thing that happened is his head got knocked off, which happens all the time with the Dragon King, um so that's pretty normal. Yeah, uh, I, I've got their inlay. I, I've got their inlay for Fireteam Zero. Uh, it's fine. Um, I have it for Scythe. I, I'm really considering replacing the Scythe one because it it doesn't cover the Rise of Fenris expansion. 
Um, it holds all the other expansions, and there's this. So I've got two boxes with the Scythe Legendary box, boxes with the Scythe Legendary box, and I kind of really only want one. So I might just, uh, you know, eat that sunk cost and um, and get a new one for it. I've I've been eyeing a few up. Um, but uh, oh, disclaimer: anyone I mention here. I've never gotten any free product. I've never got a discount or anything. I yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't <laughs> say no to some inlay sponsorships. I'm perfectly open, but I'd be surprised if these guys hear me talking about them. Um, I I mean a podcast is not exactly the greatest support to sell something that is extremely visual. <laughs> very visual, yeah. Um, but so I, I'm only going to talk about them each one the little bits. But um, the first they I have got a bunch of their inlays. I have the Gloomhaven one. I have the um, Kingdom Death one, which I reviewed on my, pa- my my personal Patreon, and huge thumbs up because it's not only really practical, but it's it's beautiful as well. It's they've laser carved a lot of extra details onto it to make it a bit of room. that sort of takes up a bit of space. That I would have liked an option to not have a dice tower in there, but it was a clever clever idea. Um, I have their Rising Sun inlay and i think a number of people have done a similar thing with this uh where all of the models like have their own little little acrylic plastic clips be- embedded inside the wood so they it just holds them it holds some of them upside down and effectively you can play a clan by just pulling this tray out and it has everything there apart from the clan uh, screen massive improvement in um in setup uh, improvement in um in setup, uh, you know, literally like, who do you want to play? Okay, okay, here you go. Here's everything. Job done. Uh, and I, 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 they're they're phenomenal. I, I go back to them for more things. My Great Western Trail has them in there, has their their insert and their player boards. They even made room for the player boards to fit. So, even made room for the player boards to fit. So, uh, phenomenal. Um, I have also been getting a few from, um, I believe they're an Italian company. Yeah, they're an Italian company called the Dice Troyers. Um, they do. That's a good name. It is a good name. Yeah, they do a um, a bunch of name. Yeah, they do a um, a bunch of root uh, inlays that I picked up, and I actually have a mix of Laser Ox and uh, Dice Troyer inlays because I have a load of 3D printed pieces for the root for all the buildings. I got a load of the models as well, um, and Laser Ox do this lovely and Laser Ox do this lovely chest that you can put everything in. But Dice Troyers do these amazing um, little player trays for each faction. And the, the best ones, in my opinion, are the otters and the mice. Uh, I just popped an image for the others to see up. And they sit... I just popped an image for the others to see up. And they sit in these tiny little cutout wells which hold them snugly. So it's like a little tray of, of mice toast if you're going to play as the Wooden Alliance. Um, it sped up everything to do in Root. Which faction are you playing? Here you go. Player board, pieces, job board, pieces, job done. And everything packs away into this single box, which is amazing. I, I love it so much that it's reduced. It's so beautiful. It is. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, the trouble I have is that too many people make beautiful Root inlays, and I've gone and bought all full root inlays and i've gone and bought all three of them uh, that i found which is the laser ox one and the dice troyers one um and now i have coming on my way from another company called tower rex i picked up the um their set to keep the because i 3d printed a load of the models load of the models um to use in the game which I'm working my way through painting and I pretty I did that because the boxes look perfect for fitting the models in so uh, I might need a second chest I'm gonna sneeze hang on nope no I'm not okay <laughs> yeah get back into it okay <laughs> yeah get back into it so uh, with Tower Rex though I mainly ordered from them because I wanted to get their spirit island organizer which puts all the expansions, um, uh, Jagged Earth and all of that into a lovely storage solution with beautiful laser cut printed, um, like cut printed, um, like designs all over it. Uh, that unfortunately didn't arrive in time for this podcast. I got news today that it's just been shipped. They had to cut it. 
Um, so I'd say that's the only thing with Tower Rex on Etsy. If you go with them, be aware that they they might um, be slower at deliver um, be slower at delivering than some of the others. Um, I, d I will give an update at some point in the future when they arrive in the intro section and say whether the inlay is as good as it looks it is. Uh, I, th I think it's going to be a very good one. And hopefully it'll um, speed up Spirit Island because currently, every time I open that box, because currently, every time I open that box, the, the all the pieces have flown around everywhere, which is frustrating. And I've also got the Viticulture, um, or Viticulture? Uh, inlay coming from Viti the... Viticulture. Viticulture. <laughs> oh, oui, oui, uh, uh, yes. Um, this this insert's terrible. <laughs> I don't I don't yeah. I don't know where anything's supposed to go in here. I'm going to leave it all in its uh in its shrink wrap and unpunched and wait for a new inlay to turn and it's um turn up. Yeah, a good inlay on that game helps a lot. Yeah, uh, it it is a really fun game though. Yeah, yeah. I I've I've heard great things about it with it. Uh, I've shown that that's the inlay I'm going for. Not that you, the listener, can hear it. Sorry. But uh, if you go to Etsy, <laughs> if you go to Etsy and look for Tower Rex, um, uh, you'll you'll uh, be able I'll to see I'll do it. what um, uh, that Electro Band does by uh, encoding a picture into the uh, that it will be like New Age podcast. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> that 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 will be great for the zero point zero 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 one percent of people who can actually do anything with that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so those are the three people or companies I've. Um, uh, reached out with to, to have a go because they were covering um, when I got Everdale with, uh, this week with um, uh, all three of the expansions Pearl Brook, Spire Crest and Bell Fair uh, I got an inlay then and it was meant to be designed only to hold Pearl Brook at the core game but I managed to get everything into the into the main box of the um, all of the boards for every single expansion in there if I hadn't have done that it would have sat snugly um, and then I couldn't bring myself to throw out any of the Everdale expansion books, uh, boxes because they're too pretty. So they're on the shelf oh. anyway. I'm a big fan of woodland animals, you know, running around a place, running around a place. As I said, Red Wall, I mentioned before, I loved that. Um, Dugton Wood, big big fan of that, as, as, as bleak and nasty as it gets at times. But um, not Watership Down or um, Animals of Farthing Wood. Those ones are... Uh, a bit too dark for me. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'll say if I'm gonna give my ranking, sort of getting towards um, the end of me monologue, should we say? Uh, I think if you, if you're a publisher and you're trying to decide what you're gonna do for your box, if it's worse than an empty box filled with ba filled with baggies, don't do it. If it's a bad plastic inlay, think of the environment don't do it. If you want a good plastic inlay, go and talk to game trays. So my scale literally goes bad plastic inlay. That's the worst possible. Then empty box with baggies. Not great. Then a box with a cardboard divider or the diamonds on top. That's fine. The good thing about that is if you if someone wants to get rid of it, it's just cardboard. Cardboard is pretty widely recycled. Um, then, you know, a good plastic formed inlay is nice and um i'll say you need to be better than sword and sorceries in make our game accessible and good because they do amazing work and i think you had some stuff to say about that didn't you audrey yeah speaking of game trades i am currently following and pledging for the kingdom rush uh second uh, it's it's not it's a second campaign for a new uh type of game a second edition with uh type of game, a second edition, we could say, but it's not a... Ah! I'm currently following the second co um, campaign for a Kingdom Rush, the second game, and for the first one, I don't, tr I didn't follow at the time, so I didn't see which uh, company they used for the insert, but they had a few issues with it, see which uh, company they used for the insert, but they had a few issues with it, uh, People reported the issues, and Lucky Duck Games listened to that. And for this new campaign, they partnered with Game Trays, and they went as far as to offer every single backer of the first campaign a $15 offer. Every single backer of the first campaign a $15 credit to go either towards new products or towards the new insert for the 
first game because they are also doing the new insert for the old game and so that people can can choose whether to use these fifteen dollars and I think that's also a good way to show that the editor has an, in, an involvement in the organization of the game in the gameplay in the ease to play yeah yeah um well you know I, I, I hope maybe someone somewhere in the publishing and design section uh, listens to all of the difference. Um, as I say, if you want to see something good and you want to have like what is what makes for a good inlay, what's going to improve people's experience, take a look at what Eclipse has done in the second edition. Have a look at On Mars um, as well. Yeah, take a look at Kingdom Rush and upcoming Unsettled. Uh, things from Rio Grande's oldest line, and that's how you don't do it. Um, at all. <laughs> ne never do a phalanx insert, don't do a generic one, and have a look at how Fantasy Flight do their cardboard inserts and do exactly the opposite of that as well, you know, if you're going to do a cardboard one. So, um, yeah, I think that's even more important. Yeah, I think that's even more important, that's my opinion, if you have games with many components. The less components you have, the less important because if you have just one card game who cares if the yeah. cards move a bit in the box but the more components you have the more uh, involved you have to be in making and selecting the more uh, involved you have to be in making and selecting the trade absolutely yes uh, also the size of your company if you're a small indie company you know you wouldn't really want to be um, splashing out on a big big possibly expensive inlay but um you know, think think about what, but um, you know, think think about what's appropriate for the design of the game. And, and also think about a box size that's appropriate for the game, because with the thermoform plastic, often the box end up, uh, the boxes end up being so huge and so empty. I end up, uh, the boxes end up being so huge and so empty. Actually, that we just wonder why. Mm. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, Manchester of Madness is a bit like that. A lot of empty space once you've unpacked everything. Um, um, yeah, definitely. I was just looking at my Fighting Zero collection, and uh, and uh, speaking of box sizes, that drives me mad. They they released a load of monster packs, um, and they are they are. Third, they're like sixty percent of the size of the expansion boxes. Um, like properly stack them, they would just like look bigger than the the main box if you put them all the side by side or on yeah. top of it. Yeah, I, I um, on my shelf, the monster box packs, which are four of, sit um together depth wise. So the the um A and B uh, because there wasn't enough room to put them on top of each other. Um, within the height of the shelving units I have, I'd have needed another five centimeters or so to make them fit. Uh, but they stick out. They stick out by about three centimeters past every single other box on the shelf. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a bit like, oh, come on. Um, I, I don't. And they're even taller than the core game box, so I don't know how I'm supposed to ever get it to fit on the shelf. But that's uh, talking about box sizes or something's probably something. Um, it, it, we could go on about that for a long time, so it's probably <laughs> probably better we wrap things up here. Probably better we wrap things up here. Um, yeah, but it goes along with inserts. Yes, absolutely. Yep, a good a good box size. Um, and standardize your box sizes, people. Try and standardize them amongst each other if you can. Um, oh, I've just noticed in due of the stars, <laughs> it went from uh they enlarged. It went from uh, they enlarged the box when they went from their first edition to their second edition, so they sit next to each other and don't <laughs> don't match in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that that that's a thing that I can quickly mention. Uh, usually, I like what uh, Awaken Realms does with their box, especially with uh, Tainted Grails. They've done a, a pretty good job at it. Especially with uh, Tainted Grails, they've done a, a pretty good job at it, having um, an insert that can. Uh, allow you to quickly save your game, like use it as a as a way to keep track of where you were the last time that you played. Mm. Uh, but what I really like is that every single one of their game try to have the last time that you played. Mm. Uh, but what I really like is that every single one of their game try to have um, 
a similar square design so their box just stacks up neatly the uh, nemesis expansion for example the two expansion are slightly smaller than the main box but slightly smaller than the main box but when put together they're exactly the same size yeah um, so it, it just looks really good in our in your shelf. It but, does, you yeah. know. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. um, amazingly, uh, or not amazingly, Games Workshop actually did that. Um, oh, that's th- good. So Shadows Over Hammer Hall, Silver Tower, and Blackstone Fortress are all exact because it's got more components, but um, they all sit on top of each other perfectly. And the 1995 Warhammer Quest almost fits exactly. It's sl- it's like half a centimeter shorter than the others. But it's pretty incredible to think um, there's, what is it, is it 20 years apart between them? Like almost standardized the length and breadth of their boxes, um, which I think is pretty impressive. Ah, so that uh, within that brings us to uh, the end of our episode. Um, and that's all we have time for. Uh, you can catch us over at our Patreon, which is www.parstandee. So goodbye from Alexis. Uh, from Belgium, au revoir. Goodbye from Alessio. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye from Audrey. Bye bye. Goodbye from myself. Goodbye. And remember that the second E in Standee is for ergonomic. <laughs>